Have you ever heard the myth that solar eclipses are linked to an increase in earthquake activity? It's a fascinating idea, but let's dive into the science behind it and uncover the truth. Welcome to my channel, where today we're debunking the misconception of the relationship between solar eclipses and earthquakes. My name is Michael, and I create 3D virtual simulations of earthquakes. Despite widespread belief, scientific research overwhelmingly suggests that the relationship between solar eclipses and earthquakes is almost non-existent. While it's an intriguing concept, there's little evidence to support the idea that these cosmic events directly influence seismic activity on Earth. Solar eclipses occur when the Moon passes between the Earth and the Sun, casting a shadow on the Earth's surface. Meanwhile, earthquakes result from the sudden release of energy in the Earth's crust, typically caused by the movement of the tectonic plates. While both phenomena are awe-inspiring in their own right, the notion that they are connected stems more from coincidence and speculation rather than scientific fact. One common misconception is that the gravitational pull during a solar eclipse could potentially trigger earthquakes. While it's true that the gravitational forces between the Earth, the Moon, and the Sun are involved in the tides, the effect on solid Earth is negligible. The gravitational influence of the Moon on Earth's tides is far greater than that of the Sun due to the Moon's proximity. While it's true that some earthquakes have occurred during solar eclipses, this is purely coincidental. Earthquakes happen constantly around the world. In fact, there's about 500,000 earthquakes every year, and on average, we get about 15 earthquakes that are above magnitude 7. Statistically, there will be earthquakes occurring during various astronomical events simply due to the frequency of both phenomena. However, there is no scientific evidence to suggest a causal relationship between solar eclipses and earthquakes. The Earth's surface absorbs solar radiation throughout the day, which warms the air above it. During a total solar eclipse, when the sunlight is blocked, the Earth's surface begins to cool as it loses its heat through radiation into space. This cooling effect is particularly pronounced in areas with dry air and clear skies, where heat can escape more efficiently. The sudden decrease in temperature can also affect the atmosphere. As the air cools, it becomes denser and it starts to sink, leading to changes in atmospheric pressure. These pressure changes can influence wind patterns and atmospheric circulation, further contributing to the temperature drop. In total, someone might experience a temperature drop of 10 to 15 degrees Fahrenheit. The influence of this temperature drop, combined with a change in atmospheric pressure, is not enough to trigger any kind of fault ruptures. Most earthquakes are identified by their epicenter locations on a map, but the reality is that they are triggered by faults located deep inside the Earth's crust, going down at least 5 to 10 miles. Now, imagine how heavy all this mass of ground is compared to everything else that is going on above in the atmosphere. So, why does this myth persist? Part of it may be due to the rarity and mysticism surrounding total solar eclipses. In average, one person sees a total solar eclipse just once in their lifetime. These celestial events captivate our imagination and often lead us to search for connections where none may exist. Additionally, the media and popular culture sometimes sensationalize the idea of celestial events causing natural disasters, leading to more misconceptions and misinformation. What we do know is that given enough time, let's say 10-20 years, over a specific area, an earthquake will happen. That's why the United States Geological Survey and FEMA have developed some earthquake risk maps, which show how likely it is to experience damaging shaking within a particular location. Here's one of these maps, and as you can see at first glance, the western part of the United States is the most at risk. There's also a secondary area of interest focused on the central United States, where the New Madrid Fault system is present. 
And obviously there's Alaska, which records the largest number of earthquakes per year in the United States, even more than California. The maximum estimated shaking intensity that a city might experience vary a lot across the United States. For example, San Francisco might experience a maximum shaking level of 12 on the Mercalli scale, which would mean ground acceleration values of more than 1 G. Whereas Chicago could only experience a maximum shaking level of 5, which is the equivalent of about 0.05 G. And that is 20 times less ground shaking than San Francisco. Next, I have created for you a 3D earthquake simulation that features all the shaking levels on the Mercalli scale. Each level on this scale describes the intensity of shaking and the observed effects on people, buildings, and the environment, ranging from imperceptible to catastrophic. It provides valuable information for assessing the impact of an earthquake on the affected area. For intensity one, the earthquake is not felt by people except under exceptionally favorable conditions, such as being on the top floor of a huge skyscraper. For intensity two, the shaking is described as weak. The earthquake is felt only by a few people, mainly those at rest, especially on the upper floors of buildings. For shaking intensity three, vibrations are felt indoors, especially on upper floors of buildings, but not outside. For shaking intensity four, the shaking is described as light. The earthquake is felt by many indoors and a few outdoors. Hanging objects swing slightly. For intensity five, the shaking is described by people as being moderate. The earthquake is felt by nearly everyone. Many people outdoors may be frightened. Some sleeping individuals might wake up. For shaking intensity number six, the earthquake is described as being strong. It is felt by everyone. Some people outdoors may panic. Buildings sway noticeably with objects falling off shelves. For intensity seven, the shaking is described as very strong. People have difficulty standing. Drivers feel their cars shaking. Hanging objects swing widely with considerable damage to poorly constructed buildings. For intensity eight, the shaking is described as severe. Damage is considerable in specially designed structures, with poorly designed structures suffering severe damage. Trees may shake noticeably. For intensity nine, the shaking is violent. There is general panic. People find it hard to stand without support. Most buildings suffer severe damage with partial collapse in some cases, especially in the unreinforced masonry buildings. For intensity 10, the shaking is described as extreme. Many buildings collapse or are severely damaged with bridges and elevated highways sustaining serious damage. Underground pipelines may be ruptured. For intensity 11, the shaking is extreme. Few buildings remain standing, bridges may collapse, and rail tracks can be bent. And for the last intensity, number 12, the shaking is purely catastrophic. Total destruction is widespread, with objects literally being thrown into the air. Ground deformations are significant, with landslides and surface rupture. If you have found my simulations to be valuable, please make sure to check my other videos on this channel. I have created more than 200 simulations of brick houses, skyscrapers, bridges, schools, office buildings, and many other type of structures. In conclusion, while the idea of solar eclipses triggering earthquakes may sound intriguing, the scientific reality tells a different story. Solar eclipses and earthquakes are independent events with little to no causal relationship between them. Thanks for joining me. If you found this video enlightening, don't forget to give it a thumbs up and subscribe for more earthquake related content. Until next time, keep questioning and stay curious.